And so, Lord, we come before you this morning with a tremendous segue of worship, singing to you great hymns of the faith that give us a reason to sing, understanding, Lord, that our joy ebbs and flows, but Jehovah remains the same. Understanding that Christ cannot die again. His eternal life guarantees our salvation and our forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Holy Spirit, unless you set our congregation aflame with the word of God, we will have met in vain. We need you, Lord. And I pray that you would come in a special way, not for the glory of any people, not so that we can say, oh, that was a great service, but Lord, that we might see you, that we may be really compelled to worship through what we see this morning in the word of God. And uh, not, the, not the act of worship, Lord, the ability to come to you and to exalt you and to lift you high. And Lord, in this world, where you're so veiled, I pray that you would please just do a gracious act by opening up our minds and our hearts this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think when most of us think about the word, just the word worship, we conjure up in our mind this. We conjure up in our mind uh, a church, a, a kind of a church service where something happens and uh, you talk on the phone like, uh, oh, did you get to worship today? Oh, yeah, I went to worship, whatever, da 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 uh, was worship good today? Oh, yeah, I mean, there was a cello and there was a violin, whatever. I think that's normally what we think of when we think about worship, music or, or praise or something. I determined that in these weeks that I'm going to study worship throughout the Bible to the best of my ability, but I confess that it's like that old joke about how do you eat a, an elephant. Uh, in the scripture, the study of worship is huge. It's giant, and, and I think I know why, because the whole point of the Bible is to bring people to God. The whole point of the scripture, 66 books of the Bible, is really to teach us how to worship and how to exalt God. I've looked at every verse in the Bible ab about worship. 180 plus passages that reference the word worship, along with equal or more numbers of passages that, that deal with words about worship, like praise or exaltation or whatever. And I want to tell you that I'm trying to eat the elephant for you. And, and what I've told Amy is I, I feel like that, you know, some sermons work differently. This sermon, I feel like I have too much. You know, it's like, you know, what part do you give them that, that really brings them? So I know the Lord's going to help us, but we must view worship from an aspect of the word of God, of him telling us what worship is, and not what modern people say worship is, and not what, you know, your gut feeling about worship is, because that'll never work. We began this study because we were in this series, What in the World Should the Church Be Doing? Looking at the early church, just after Christ died, he was raised, he ascended, the Holy Spirit indwelled believers, and the church was born. It wasn't born, it exploded. And people were coming to Christ, and by the way, people are still coming to Christ, people, uh, God is still building his kingdom, don't worry about that, that's up to him, he's still calling men to salvation. But it was happening in a phenomenal, brand new way, and we, we've been looking at that experience in Acts chapter 2 of the church forming, beginning, and, and what we have seen is really we've broken down that passage into four ideas, categories, core truths, whatever. And if you remember, the first one starts out with what? What is it? Yell out. What is it? Oh, thank you for those three people that have been listening for this year. All right. It's reaching, right? Reaching. And then what? Yell it out. What? Involving, right? And then maturing. And this last chunk is worshiping. The first 46 and 47 of that passage says, and they continued... Uh, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And here in verse 47, praising God. You know, here's the worship and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This praising God was not a new thing. Okay, it didn't happen when Christ, you know, ascended and then all of a sudden people started praising God. That, that's the whole way through the Old Testament. It wasn't a new thing in, for the early church, but there were definitely aspects of worship that were brand new. 
There are definitely aspects of worship where things changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The primary new thing of worship was that the way to God was wide open. In the Old Testament, there was a literal, physical reminder of a barrier, of a veil between you and the Holy of Holies where God, His presence resided. Christ, when He died on the cross, you remember that that veil was ripped from the top, from heaven, down to earth. And God says, come on in, come worship me, come learn who I am through Jesus Christ. And what is the newest thing about worship is that salvation is made clear, the slaughtered lamb for my sins and your sins hung upon a cross so that your offense is before holy God and it is offensive to be sinful before God. And you can never come to God still remaining in your sin. And it's not the matter of you cleaning up, it's a matter of you repenting and seeing yourself as a sinner and knowing that someone took the punishment for you already on that cross. And so the wall comes down, and as Jesus died for the sins that you did this morning, and the sins that you did yesterday, and the sins of your entire lifetime, yesterday, and three weeks from now, as you put your trust and faith in Jesus as your Savior, and what he did on that cross, and rising from the dead, the door opens, and you can come to God, and you can call him Abba, you can call him Daddy, you can really worship him, and sin is not an issue anymore, because it's already dealt with on the cross. This is the biggest, newest thing as the early church wish, worship. That, that God was not a, a, a distant God and a judge, but rather he, he had come to live inside of them and dwell them by his, his spirit. He'd become a Abba Father to them and the lover of their souls. This was all new. God was personal. There are other things that were new. In the Old Testament, the people only came a few times a year to God corporately to worship. That's certainly not what it's like in the New Testament. Personally, you and I worship every day. We walk with God. We worship in our cars. We worship in our showers. And that's, you know, some place, the only place that some of us should sing. No, I'm not really honest about that. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, right? We, uh, we worship God whistling, walking down the road, praying in our prayer closets. And we constantly come before God. And corporately, God instituted this crazy great thing called the local church where we get together with believers on a regular basis and as much as possible. The other church every day, okay? We come together at least weekly on the Lord's Day gathering to worship the Lord. The reason, too, for that is Christ. That's the new thing, too. Because we are told that we are the body of Christ and that we corporately coming together are His body. And we are connected, and your spiritual growth has to do with my spiritual growth, and all of that. And worship, of course, is new in the New Testament, because it is not only the Jews who are the chosen people of God. The Bible says, Jews and Gentiles, all alike, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what a great thing, because most of us would not be here right now if if it was only for the Jews to worship. We all now can come, all of us, all the world may worship God from the heart, in spirit, and in truth, because of Jesus Christ, grafting us in, Gentiles, and and making us all the chosen of God who trust in him. I just want to say this before we go on. I don't know everyone here, and if if we're going to be talking in the next many minutes about worship, and I can, the starting place to that is Jesus in your life. The starting place, you can't, you can't sidestep Jesus. You can't forget Jesus. You can't come to God to worship in in any way. The only door, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the only way. So the starting place for you to worship is understanding the cross and the resurrection and calling and trusting on the Lord Jesus, what he did for yourself. Believing on that, that your sins were upon that cross and that he is the sufficient Savior. That is the beginning place of worship. Amen, believers, those who, who know him? Yes, he is. He is the beginning place of our worship. I've already given you in past messages Old Testament words for worship. Today I'd like to start by giving you New Testament words for worship. This is the three kind of chunks of our sermon. New Testament words for worship. And then I'd like to consider really starting putting together a definition, a biblical definition of worship. And finally we're going to see an example to worship in verses of the scripture. There's so many notable, turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 15, There are so many notable 
major passages in scripture on congregational worship, in corporate worship, when, when God's people came together. And many of them are just wonderful illustrations and examples that we can see some timeless truths about worship. This is one of them. The Ark of the Covenant had been lost. Uh, they tried to bring it back. It was brought back the, 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 uh, the wrong way, and a man died. And now David brings it back to Jerusalem the correct way, and the people are worshiping, and David is worshiping. First Chronicles, beginning in verse number, uh, First Chronicles chapter 15, beginning in verse number 25, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you be seated because I'm going to read a sizable chunk, okay? So you stay awake, but stay seated. I'm going to read the end of verse, or chapter 15 into 16. I want you to get the whole deal and think about the worship here. So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Edom, Edom, Odom, uh, with joy, with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they, they offered seven bullocks and seven rams and David was clothed with a robe of fine linen and all the Levites that bear the Ark and the singers and the Chenaniah, the master of the song with the singers. David also had upon him an ephod of linen. You know, that was kind of a priestly garment, a, a worship kind of garment. Thus, Uh, All Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting, with the sound of the coronet, and with trumpets, and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps, all these instruments. And it came to pass as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michal, or Michael, however you want to pronounce it, the daughter of Saul, looking out a window, saw King David dancing and playing. She despised him in her heart. So they brought the Ark of uh, of God and set it in the midst of the tent, that David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt uh, sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an, an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And he dealt to every man of Israel, both man and woman, uh, to every one a loaf of bread and, and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record, to uh, thank and, and praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and next to him, Zechariah, and there's a lot of men's names there, Jer- Jeril, Sh- Shemariath, and Jehiel, and Matiah, and whatever, and Eliab, and Beniah, and Obed-Edom, and Jer- Jer- Jael, with psalteries and with harps. But Asaph made a sound with cymbals. Beniah also, and, and Jehazel, the priest with trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Then on that day, David delivered uh, first this psalm, it's Psalm 105 in your Bible, by the way, to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing songs unto him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and his judgments of his mouth. I want to pause here and I want you to look up here a moment. I'm going to keep reading. But what I'd like you to do as you put yourself in this real chapter, this real time of worship, is to think about what was going on here in the worship. What does David mean when he's saying these things? What does this have to do with the, when you walk into Lighthouse Baptist Church into, the, in, into this worship area? What, what does it really mean to worship? Okay, let's keep going. 13. O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even of the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee will I give the land of of Canaan the lot of your inheritance when you were but a few, even a few, and strangers in it. And when they went from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among, the, among all nations. 
For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord hath made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness in his place. Given to the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Given to the Lord, glory and strength. Given to the Lord, the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it, it be not moved. Let the heavens be glad and, and let the earth rejoice and let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that are in and then shall the trees of the wood sing out in the presence of the Lord because he cometh to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, save us, O God, our salvation and gather us together and deliver us from the heathen that he may give thanks to his holy name and glory in his praise, in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said amen and praise the Lord. We will come back to this chunk of scripture as an example this morning of worship. But I wanna first take you to the New Testament words of worship. God specifically chose words in verses to explain what he meant by worship and praise. And we need to get these words into our mind to understand how he explains worship. So I'm gonna take you through the New Testament words. Number one, prosukaneo. It means to do obeisance or obeisance, which is a, a big word that just means physically showing honor and respect to someone, to do reverence to. You can really understand this word better by understanding the two words that are glued together in the Greek that make this whole word and this whole idea. So the first one is toward, and the second one is to kiss. Toward, to kiss. It's a reverential, honor, humility, obedient, submissive kiss. And when you think about toward, to kiss, it's not talking about like lovey-dovey. It's talking about like kissing a A king's ring, you know, you got that picture, ancient picture of bending down, bowing down, and kissing a ring or something. This word is the most frequent word in the Bible, or excuse me, in the New Testament, for worship. Toward to kiss, to do reverence, to humbly show reverence to to someone or something. Another word in the New Testament is sabomai. It means to revere. But it really stresses, this word is interesting because it stresses the feeling of, of awe or devotion in worship. You say, Pastor, there's supposed to be feeling in worship? Absolutely. Feelings are a part of worship. The devotion of your heart, the earnestness of understanding what you're saying and what you're singing and and how you're testifying to God. But it's very important to remember that the worship is to and for God's sake. So feelings are part of worship, but not the main part of worship. Certainly, our feelings are important, but not the central focus. And I want to tell you, in our generation, this is where a lot of believers have totally gotten off track. Feelings have, been, have become, as it were, an idol, rather than understanding that worship is all about God. It's not about me. Let me say it this way. I don't worship to feel something, but when I'm truly worshiping, I will feel something. Does that make sense? Is that a good balance? Uh, There's a pastor down in Washington named Mark Dever, Capitol Hill Baptist Church, that says it this way. In our evangelical culture, worship too often refers to the emotions that we experience as we perhaps close our eyes and sing about God. And we can be more caught up in that experience, and look at this, than in the God who is supposed to be the origin of the experience. Right? We, okay, let me just say this. I want to stop right here. It's not a 50-50 thing. It's not feelings and focus on God. Worship is all about focusing on God. It's all about that. The feelings are the secondary thing. They're not what you go after. You go after God. You go after exalting God. He is the deal. We should instead focus our hearts and minds on God and Christ in our worship. So if worship has a lot of passion, but no genuine thought, that's not worship. What he's saying is, if you're just thinking about yourself and how you feel, but you have no thoughts That's why I knew I was going to preach this to you. That's why at the offering time, I made the comment that this music has so much content about God. You are, when we're worshiping, we're we're thinking about God. You're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about God. You're not thinking about the experience. You're thinking about God and Christ and the great doctrines of what brings you to God. God. 
The converse is also true, Dever says. If worship is only thinking right things with no intention to stir affections towards God, it too is false. So if you, you know, you, you, you have this experience of worship where it's all about scholarship and it's all about, you know, theology or it's all about the, the details, but there's, not any, it, there's nothing from the heart, that's false worship also. We'll talk about this more in a minute. I love Dever's quote. I think it's the proper balance as we can even see from the words as we'll go through of worship in scripture. Feelings, yes, but God as the main focus, not us. I do want to point out a little bit of church history to you, that, that the gospel hymns, during the 1700s, the 1800s, there was incredible hymns. Isaac Watson writing these great, incredible hymns like uh, um, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, I think that's Luther, but these great giant hymns that we sing that are full of content and make God obviously the center focus. But something happened, 1910s, 1920s, and on, that was called gospel hymnody, or it was called you know, gospel music, right? Sounds good, right? Gospel's a good word. But most of these hymns were very shallow and even silly. I've got peace like river, I got peace like river, I got peace like river in my soul. I got peace like river, I got peace like river. What? focused on our feelings rather than the Lord, than being, than exalting him and being lifted up and lifting up him in his true truth. Many of the praise and worship song from the 1990s, kind of in a more professional way, was the same point, very shallow, extremely repetitious, saying the same kind of things, feelings driven. It was all about feelings driven and how I can, you know, move, get my experience going. But then in the last 10 years, we have entered into a very rich season of God-focused hymns. You know, it kind of reminds me, my brother and I are into cars. We love cars, you know, we like to follow cars, we like whatever. We are in a great season of of cars right now, okay? You know, the Camaro and the Corvette and the Challenger and the Charger and all these great vehicles. Some of you have no idea, some of you are like, vroom, vroom, right? But I remember the 1980s, it was the worst season in the world for vehicles. Late 70s, 80s, the Chevy Citation, you know, the car that should never have been made, the K car, really? You know, you go, whatever. If you have a four-door, it's we go. Um, You know, it was horrible. It seems like hymnody has made a change in a spiritual realm, not in vehicles. But in the last 10 years, we have gotten some incredible sound singable, worshipful hymns focus on God alone and Christ alone. I will glory in my Redeemer. The deep, deep love of Jesus, for instance. Uh, his robes for mine. Oh God, my joy. These songs that we sing are rich and they're full and they bring us to God and they're focused on Him. These are a great addition to the great ancient hymns we also sing. There's a third word. A third word uh, in the New Testament is uh, lat rat uo. It means to serve. It's, it's really focused not on the experience like we would think of, of a worship time, but rather serving the Lord. And here we find a new detail about worship, something that expands our brains and our understanding a little bit. Worship isn't always about a church service. It's not always about, you know, this hymn or that hymn or this testimony. In fact, worship is much more vast and broad than that. And worship is also serving the Lord and acts of devotion and worship to him. I think a great illustration of that is this past Friday here here at church, okay? So this past Friday, a lot of crazy things went on. A lot of good things, a lot of crazy things. So all the ice and all the whatever, and there's a guy who's shoveling the ice off the stairs, what is he doing? Shoveling ice off the sh- stairs? Why is he doing in a church? He's serving the Lord. Okay, he's serving the Lord. So then the, uh, something in the fellowship hall springs a leak, right? And there's like a flood in the middle of the fellowship hall. Literally, puddles in the f- middle of the fellowship hall. And so then some guys from church have to come and engage in that, right? So what are they doing? Are they sucking up water? No, they're worshiping the Lord. They're doing it. This is for the sake of the Lord. Okay, this is not because they just you know, can do that, right? It's for the Lord. 
I came over to the auditorium. There's some ladies, and they're getting ready for the missions conference and mission banquet, and they're thinking, they're working things through, and they got very physical kind of things and this and this. What are they doing? Are they making food? Are they thinking about tables and arrangements, whatever? No, they're worshiping. They're serving the Lord. This is for the service of the Lord. If there was no such thing as the Lord, they wouldn't be doing it. They're doing it for the Lord. And there were other people as well engaging. All of this was service of worship. And don't you ever think that watching babies in the nursery is about watching babies or changing diapers. It is about serving the Lord God and his great gospel. And from ushers to anything that you engage in, to making chicken and mashed potatoes, you are worshiping. One of the words that the Lord uses in the New Testament to explain worship is serving him, serving him whether it be to individual people or around a local church. The next word is sebashma. Sebashma, say that a couple of times. That's a noun in the New Testament used for worship that speaks of what you are devoted to, the object of your worship, the the thing that you're staring at to worship. Is it the true God that you're worshiping in your life, or is it something else? And these idols, I would not Accuse any of you of having these statues at home with little fires and incense burning to them. I doubt that that's the idols that you make for yourself, but what about the idol of money? What about the idol of, of leisure? What, the, what about the idol of friendships? The idol of, of status, of popularity, of jobs, whatever. This word, sabasma, is talking about what you worship, the object of your worship. And there's only one thing to worship in this lifetime. It is God and God alone. He's only one worthy of worship. In addition to the words that are translated worship, there are also words of praise in the New Testament. Words that are, you know, that God uses for praise. So let me give you a couple of those. Ainos, Ainos. This word is only used one way in our New Testament. It is to speak praise to God and God alone. But what it means is really cool. It means a tale, T-A-L-E, not T-A-I-L, not a tale, a tale or a narrative. So God's translating it, praise, in the New Testament, and the background of it is to tell a tale or a narrative. Now we pick up another thought about when we worship. Here it is. Worship highlights the story of God. The narrative of God forever in the past and forever in the future. It is a tale about who he is, Worship narrates his greatness, his works, his glory, his character. Worship is his story, not ours. And how crazy it is when you get to the point where you think of worship is about you. It's not about you at all. It's about his story, his narrative, how he instructs us as people. We are worried in our days about worship, war, worship wars Books are written about postures of worship and styles and expressions and this music and that music. And really, that is so little of the matter at all about worship. God and his narrative is the focus of worship. Not what your hands are doing, not what your feet are doing or whatever. Not exactly how this twangs and that twangs. It's not about your performance. I love that we have these cello and violin and we have instruments to play and we have different instruments guitars and flutes i love that that's all very extremely biblical but these are not the worship these are arrows pointing to god these are tools to bring us to focus on his narration on on what he has done through the ages and in such great ways everything from from choosing Israel, creation, choosing Israel, giving the law, giving prophets, forecasting the the perfect Savior coming, Jesus Christ, of Holy Spirit coming down, coming inside of us, to protecting us, to guiding all these things, these narrative to what he's going to do in the future, all of them, highlighting that, talking about that, repeating that, being awed and wowed by that, that is worship, worship, his narrative. Epinas is another New Testament word, it means commendation or praise. But it, it is used as a noun to signify the exhibition of God's character and operations. And I know it's a lot of words, and I wouldn't understand that if I hadn't studied and written it down. It's like 
this thing is praise, the praise of God. This object is the praise of God. Not necessarily saying something or singing something. Here's an example of it. I want to throw up a verse that, of how God uses it. In Ephesians 1 and verse number 12, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Leave the verse up. You'll notice in the verse, it's not talking about praising the Lord. It's saying you are the praise of the Lord. This is another word that how God you know, works in the New Testament, how he describes worship. In the verse, we are God's worship. We are God's praise, not something that we can do with our mouth or with our body, but we ourselves who have trusted in Christ, God calls us praise. He said, they are the praise. A neo is another word. It speaks, uh, it's about speaking praise of God by angels sometimes in the, in the New Testament and by men. It's a testimony of speech we're going to come to this music in a minute, but this is a testimony not of singing, but of talking, of giving testimony. Tonight, we're going to have uh, some hymn favorites, and, uh, or you can call that Pickle on the Pianist, uh, and we're going to have a couple, some testimonies, a little time for you to do this word, a neo, so you can give testimony about the Lord. That word is contrasted with the word hum neo, it's the New Testament word that means to sing praises, singing hymns. The Gospels use this word in reference to the, those few psalms that I told you about called the Halil hymns that were sung, Psalm 113 and around there during the Passover. And where you find worship, folks, you always find music. Where you find worship in the scriptures, you very close around it will find singing and you'll find instruments now let me just go out and let me t- make two huge statements about this. The highest purpose of music is not to make you feel good, but to exalt God. You know, whether it be secular music, whether it be folk music, whether it be whatever, the highest use of music is to bring God glory to worship him. I want to go out one inch farther and in saying this, and I think I can back it up scripturally, that God created the, the main purpose that he created music, that is the sustaining of notes and chords and arrangement and, and even harmony. You ever think about it? What if there was no harmony? What if everything was sang in one melody all the time? Do you how beautiful harmony, why the piano sounds so great and why different instruments and deep, different people singing different parts, you know, is this thing that God created called harmony? I'm going to say, and I, I think I'm right, that the, the primary purpose of God creating music And the first place was so that men could praise the Lord in a unique and a beautiful way. So that the great words and testimonies of uplifting God could also have a background of sound that sounded beautiful as well. When we're singing, we're talking how great God is. But we're sustaining and there's these instruments and it is a beautiful thing to God. And I believe he created it primarily for that reason. Scripture is chucked full of singing and playing to God. Chucked full. Number nine, pasalo, pasalo. That's hard to say the ps and s. You know, Americans don't do that, but it's pasalo, which means to twitch or twang. You say, oh, preacher, last Sunday, I had a twitch or a twang right here, and I was scratching it as we worship. Amen, praise the Lord. No, it's a New Testament word, that twitch or twang, meaning to describing the plucking of an instrument. It is also, it can also be translated, it is sometimes in our New Testament, by the word sing, but it has that twang, that like a guitar or a mandolin or whatever, plucking an instrument, even you, pluck, you pluck a cello and even sometimes a violin. Music is huge in worship to the Lord. So having seen the Old Testament words before, and these New Testament words for praise and worship. How should we define worship? How can, we, how can we give it a definition so that we can start understanding what we do here? And yes, it does matter, folks. Let me give you some ideas. Vine's exhaustive Bible dictionary concerning this word worship means the worship of, or says, the worship of God is nowhere defined in Scripture. A consideration of the above verbs, that's the ones we just looked at, shows that it is not confined to praise. Broadly, it may be regarded as the direct acknowledgement to God of his nature, 
his attributes, ways, and claims, whether by the outgoing of the heart in praise and thanksgiving or by the deed done in such acknowledgement. As you look at the words God uses in the verses, three verses of the Bible trying to show us how to praise and worship, you can see that worship isn't just church music time. It is a whole life focused on God's character and acknowledging him and his attributes and his ways and his claims. It does often involve the outpouring of our heart, as Vine says, with words and songs and thanks, but serving God is also a great part of worship. Works done for God in ministry, for others, for God. This is all worship if it is being done with God and focus for God. It is both personal and can be public and congregational. Baker's Bible dictionary that some of you use sees worship as acts and attitudes toward God's. Toward God, sorry, not plural, God. So acts, things that I do, and attitudes, what is within me. And I think that's very good, a very simple way to look at it. Uh, Outward acts to God, for God, that come from a worshiping heart. And that can be singing, too, and testifying also, or doing something for someone in, in God's name, in Christ's name, or doing something at your local church, worshiping, ministering. There's an Australian theologian, David Peterson, that defines worship this way. Engaging with God on the terms that he purposes and the way that he alone makes possible. And I think Peterson catches something else about worship. And that the attitude by which you approach God is very important. And he also mentions the way. And there is no way other than Jesus Christ by the way that God made available to us. We live in an amazing time, New Testament time of grace, where anyone can come to God through Jesus Christ. And it says if Jesus opens his arms and says, whosoever will may come and drink the water of life freely, to imagine the God who made all of this as you look, hey, look, the sky's blue, by the way. I think that's blue, or it's a tin on our windows. Just pretend it's blue. God who made all that beautiful blue sky and, and the trees that will someday, someday have leaves again and, and the glory of all that he has made, that you can approach him. And you can tell him how great he is. You can adore him and admire him, and he likes it. And he accepts it because you are in Christ. Peterson goes on to say that worship includes all of life worship, our affections, our actions, our obedience, our relationships, and it includes corporate worship, our times of praising God and edifying one another together. And so we have seen both the Old Testament and the New Testament words that describe worship. We have seen some definitions of of worship, but I want to show you the illustration of the verses that we open to. So would you turn please to 1 Chronicles 15 again, We're not going to read this all through. We've read it twice now, pretty much twice. All right, hopefully you've got it in your mind. I want to just go down through it, and I want to point out some things about worship in our text that you will see come from the words that I talked about, but there's some additional things here to add to your idea of how to worship the Lord. So I want you to know, beginning in verse number 15, 25, that worship is joyful. Look at the end of verse number 25. They brought that ark with joy, with joy. If you were to go through your, the book of Psalms, the book of worship in your Bible, the word joy, or a form of it, appears over a hundred times. When you come before the Lord, you can come with joy. I want to say that word can come because I come back to Jesus again. He really truly has forgiven our sins and we can come before our Father in joy. When I was getting up this morning and just having a devotional time, my Bible fell open before this passage and I saw, it says that David appointed the Levites to lead the music with resounding joy. That was the attitude. That was was the spirit they were going to have, resounding joy. The music and the praise and the worship was not angry and it was not violent and it was not, but it was not, It was not dismal, hello, and it was not uh, sterile either. Verse 25, when they brought up this Ark of the Covenant with joy, that Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God 
It was called the mercy seat. It's a picture of where, you know, it was like a footstool on earth where God put his feet. That's the literal feeling. You know, it was in the Holy of Holies. This was something that, that was viewed as a place where you come and meet God, his presence. And so is worship. That piece of furniture represented the fact that they were going to be able to get as close to God as they possibly could. And, and so they said, come with joy. Bring it with joy. Because it is a joyful thing to get as close to God as you possibly can. Acts 2 in the early church, you know, that's what we springboarded off of, or however you say that. They had gladness, and they were praising God with joy. In verse 28 of, of chapter 15 here in your text, they are shouting with joy. They are playing very, various instruments of praise to God with joy. What's my point? Our worship cannot be sterile or dismal. Your worship cannot, whether it be at home, in your closet, your prayer closet, or as you drive down the road listening to worship music, or whether you come into this place, it cannot be sterile and dismal. It is not somber in the way of of that I am coming to God and there's no help there. Why is worship joyful? Because on the worst Lord's Day, on the worst Sunday, when it is snowy or rainy and negative and you've got a bunch of sorrow going on in your life, in the worst, wor- uh, the worst Lord's Day, when someone is parked in your parking place and they are sitting in your chair when you come in here, on the worst day, the answer is always coming to the Lord. The answer is always God has the answer. The answer is always if I look at God, there is hope. If I look at God, there is peace, there is joy. You say, hey, do you, have you read those, those, uh, those psalms of David? When at the beginning of the psalm, he is so negative and he's downcast and he's, he's all discouraged. Why art, thou dis- why art thou cast down on my soul and why art thou disquieted in me? Why the heathen rage and the wicked imagine a vain thing? Oh, the heathen are better off than me, blah, 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 blah. By the end, when he comes to worship before the Lord, his attitude, his heart is completely changed. I don't know if you know who Alistair Begg is, but he talks about worship leaders that you come in and the first, first thing on a Sunday morning they do is try to pump you up. Y'all feeling good? Blah, 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 blah. He, and he says, what? Don't tell me, don't ask me how I feel. Tell me what I know. Don't tell me how my flesh is feeling. Show me God in Christ and the, and the Holy Spirit. Show me great truths of, of the cross. And then my feelings eventually will get around to it. When we worship, folks, it needs to be joyful before the Lord. Number two in the passage, worship is personally comprehensive. It is personally comprehensive. That's the best way I could say is like all in, being all in. A wholehearted attitude and act. In verse 29, as we read, you know, David is dancing and playing before the Lord. McCall, one of his, his wives, that's a whole other story there. He, he doesn't have his kingly robes on. He has a, the Bible, the King James uses the word for naked in one of the passages in Samuel. But he had, these, he had this linen uh, garment on that was a, a worship garment, okay, like, like a priest would wear. You know, so she didn't like that. She, she didn't think that that looked respectable enough. And she didn't like the fact that he was leaping and praising the Lord. She did not understood, understand what David understood about God. She did not understand that David understood that we're to worship God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the great commandment. It's the greatest commandment, Jesus said. You've got to be all in when you're worshiping the Lord. All in, like David was. In the parallel passage, passage in 2 Samuel 6, 14, it says, David danced before the Lord with all his might. And he wasn't going to apologize to McCall either. Leaping, praising, expressing his worship. Folks, our worship is to be wholehearted and uninhibited and full of expression and devotion and exaltation of God. And yes, that means heart and body. If you're waiting for me to say that, yes, I'll say it. You see these bodily words of worship as you go through the scripture, the entire scripture. All right? Head and prostrate, and bow, and raise hands, and fall down, and clap hands, and hear dancing, and leaping. Are you afraid of those words? Are you afraid of God's words, of Bible words? I am not. 
Those are not sensual or chaotic words. I'm sure you could twist them and express them in a chaotic or sensual way, but they are not. They are Bible words of worship. The point is God wants us to, walk, to worship all in with our whole being, with everything that we are. With our heart, yes, but our expression also. Am I saying that we need to start a ministry of holy dancing? No. But neither am I saying that there's anything wrong with being physically expressive in your worship. And I believe that it's seen the whole way through Scripture and it's very appropriate despite our tradition. The problem comes when people like McCall judge, look, and stare at other people who, who are being expressive in their worship and judge the motives of those people who would wholeheartedly, emotionally, and expressively worship the Lord. Those judging attitudes have stifled expressive worship in our circles and have brought doctrines of men that have negated the very clear examples and real verses of Scripture. I want to say this clearly. You really have to jump through hoops and ignore dozens of verses and illustrations in your Bible if you think there's something wrong with physical expressions of worship. You have to really just take your, take your scissors to the Bible. And I know that a lot through inductive, a lot of men who, through inductive and deductive reasoning and logic of men who have done that. I want to be honest that I've grown in this area. My problem before was judging the motives of others outside of our camp that were more expressive than we were of looking at them as if I could be God and see their heart and, and decide that they are somehow lifting their hand or clapping before the Lord because of a wrong motive. God, forgive me for thinking badly of those who are actually mimicking the very verses of the word of God. And I would just ask you, those of you with hang-ups this way, are you going to hold on to your tradition rather than clear Bible. We never want to want our corporate worship to turn into some kind of charismatic chaos, but trust me folks, we're not anywhere near that here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Number three, worship is confession and restoration. Confession and restoration. We saw this last week. I'm not going to take hardly any time of it, but you cannot come before God to enjoy him, to magnify him, to lift him up the way that you should, to draw near to his presence if there is something between your soul and your Savior. If you are holding on regarding iniquity in your heart, if you're holding on to continual sin, forsake it, confess it, and get enjoying God, I'll say. Get to enjoying God. That's seen in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 16 that they were sacrificing and, and having burnt offerings before him and peace offerings, communion before him. Number four, worship begins thanking the Lord, thanking the Lord. So scan in with your eyeballs for 7, chapter 16, 7, 8, 34, 35, all talking about thanking God. Believe that God has been, folks, good to you. Many of you thank the God of coincidence for the good things in your life when you should be thanking Jehovah God. All good and all perfect gifts come from a God, from the God above, the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. It is from the Lord. Believe and realize all the good things that the Lord has done in your life are from Him, even in this broken world of sin. Your life, His mercy to save you, your family, your possessions, His guidance, His help, His food, creation, your Bible, your church, etc. Thanking God is a huge part of worship. Thank you, God. I acknowledge it was not the strength of my own hands that brought this to me. You are the air in my lungs. You are the strength in my muscles. You are everything, God. You get the credit. You get the glory. Worship is also dependence in verse number 8, 16, 8. You see this phrase, call upon his name. You see that the whole way into the New Testament. You finish it for me. For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. This is not a new phrase in Romans there. It's an old phrase, clear back through the scripture. It is a picture of dependence. Yes, dependence in salvation, but dependence in all of your life. To call upon your name. What's that sound like? Help! Help me, Lord. I need you. I think he gets tired of, me hear, uh, tired of hearing me say that. I say it all the time with great, you know, 
pathos, with great passion, Lord, I need you. That's great. I'm glad you've come to that place because dependence is worship. Number six, number six, worship is recognizing and repeating the narrative of God working. You remember we saw that word that meant a tale or a narrative of God. Well, here we see it again. So look down at verse number eight and verse number 12, and you, hear, you, you see phrases like this, make known his deeds among the people. A good portion of worship is recognizing, acknowledging, admiring, and repeating what God has done, not just in your life, you selfish person. I preach to myself too but what he has done clear from the beginning of the universe. All that he has done. Acknowledging it, repeating it, the narrative of God and what he will do in, future, in the future is part of worship. Talking about his working and his deed. Make his deeds known in worship. I think it's kind of interesting that it, it even says among the heathen, among unsaved people. It is good and it is worshipful to repeat before unbelievers what God has done in the world. You always see in the Old Testament them doing this, in Psalms, always doing it. What's David talking about? He's talking about sometimes the flood. He's talking about him, uh, God bringing them out of Egypt, out of Babylon. He's talking about the great works that God has done, the plagues and all of that. We need to also worship God by speaking openly, and reminding and repeating what God has done. Number seven, worship is rejoicing in the Lord and edifying others through music through music. We already hit on that in the word, but you'll see that in verse 9 and 23 and 42. And I think it's kind of interesting in verse 33, it starts talking about a freaky thing. It starts talking about creation singing to the Lord. And uh, whether that is talking about, you ever walk through the woods and you hear the trees singing, the, the wind coming through the trees and whistling, and whether it's talking about that kind of stuff, what it looks to me in verse 33 is it's talking about a day coming in the millennium when God will judge and then we'll have this perfect world that creation sings and worships the Lord. Music is always a part of worship, rejoicing in the Lord and edifying others by what we are singing. And finally, the last one in this passage is worship is giving God admiration and repeating who he is. So not just his deeds, but what he's like. The character of what he's like. You see this in verse 10, in verse 24 through 29. I want to I read you that 24 through 29 so that you can see what I'm talking about, about worshiping God by repeating who he is. It says, declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. We're describing God. We're saying uh, what it is like to to come to God. Give unto the Lord, ye, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Look up here a moment. What do we have to give God? We the little drummer drummer boy? That's a great little song, Christmas song. What do I have to give him? I'll give him all my heart, okay. But this passage doesn't say that. It's talking about a, a type of worship where you are saying publicly the attributes of God and why he is glorious. That is something you can give him, and if you don't, you're holding it back. You're a thief of God's glory. Give him, say, God is glorious, and why? Give him strength. What? Give him strength. No, say, he is strong. Ascribe to him is the idea of the verse. Ascribe to him, God is the strongest being anywhere. He can do anything. That is part of worship, admiring him for who he is. We were made to, to see the worthy God. We're made for his, Revelation 4.11 says we were made for his will and his pleasure and his glory. We were made to see the worthy, worthy God and then willfully as a people who had been redeemed from being his enemy to brag and to boast about his grace and his love and his mercy and his long suffering and his strength and his goodness and his justice and his judgment and dozens more of the attributes of God. God has made us to do this. This is worship. 
I expect that a whole month of sermons could be preached from this simple chapter, and I won't. But can I ask you this morning, if you are for fulfilling God's purpose of being created, maybe some of you have said, why am I here? You are here to glorify God and to worship him. Are you worshiping and glorifying God? Do you spend this time of personal worship alone or, are new, or, or do you neglect bowing to him? Do you neglect exalting him personally? What about when you come into this place of worship? Do you wholeheartedly participate in church worship? So I was in California a couple weeks ago and uh, something notable happened. So there are 5,000 There's like 4,000 people in the auditorium, pastors, men, 100% men, and 1,000 in an overflow video place, and we are singing, and it is ridiculous. It is piercing. It is unearthly. We are singing the same songs that we sing here, great hymns of the gospel and Christ's redemption, the very same songs. And it is incredible. And we enjoyed it and worshiped greatly. And we stayed for Sunday. And we went in there and saw this packed house, two services, 2,500 each. Packed this house, we're ready to sing. And we open our hymn books and we sing and praise to God. And me and my brother and Scott are the only ones singing loud. And the rest of the people are barely What's the difference? There's no glory to the fact that a guy's a pastor or whatever, but something different is going on there. Those 5,000 men have dedicated their lives to the Lord and their living before him in the fear of God and loving him and getting all that they can get of him and it comes out even in the volume of their singing. When you come into this place, you gotta give it your all. You have got to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, your expression, your volume, praising and uplifting God with all that you are. Enough of sterile and dismal worship. God is worthy to be praised. The whole book is about coming to him and be able to exalt him and be able to see him. All the rest of heaven is about exalting the Lord. So let us, who know the Lord through Jesus Christ, give our best right now. Would you bow your heads, please? Father.